Oh, I was having so much fun there. I almost missed the cue that the music was about to be ending. Oh my goodness. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the stream. It is good to be here with you on a Sunday afternoon. Ah, uh, just the staple of my week is coming here and answering your questions about FPV, about FPV and drones and oh, just whatever we can, we can whatever we can think of that we want to talk about. Ah, woo! And we are going to be taking your questions, but as usual, I'm going to start the live stream with a little bit of bold... Should I say it? Should I say it? Ah, you know, uh, you know, Blunty, I always try and keep the, the streams, like, mostly family-friendly, but I do, like, I say, like, pain in the ass sometimes. How, how strong of a swear is pain in the ass, Blunty? In 2024, it doesn't seem like it's... I agree. To me, it does not seem strong. I agree. But a guy left a comment. I'm not going to, like, call him out by name because it doesn't deserve... I'm not trying to, like, hate on them. Everybody has different standards. He left a comment, and he was like, you know, Bardwell, you used to be... I used to let my kids watch your content, and I never had to think twice about whether it was okay. But uh, now, there's a lot of... You're, I don't know if you've just become more bitter over the years or if you've let your standards slide, but there's... Oh, I don't like letting my kids watch your content because of all your swearing. And I went... I was like... What is this guy talking about? And I went back and I, I like re, I actually looked at the transcript of the video and scrolled through it. And the nearest thing I could tell, the only vaguely swear was I said something was a pain in the ass. And I was just like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to say it. <laughs> I don't know. Parents, would you let your kids hear a person say pain in the ass? Like, it's a, it's a wild world out there. Like, how protective do you really need to be? Everybody makes their own decisions. But I did. I, You know, here's the thing. You know, Blunty, I, I am at my at my heart a helpful person. Like, I want to – I don't know what's wrong with me because, like, this guy was complaining and I would have been well within my rights to just say F off, which I know you're not shy about doing. Right? Yeah, at all. Yeah, at all. <laughs> I, I shudder to go look at the number of accounts – on the live stream clips channel, which which for those of you who don't know, Blunty runs the live stream clips channel. It's, it's just like his his thing. I shudder to think about how many accounts you have blocked and just banned. Oh. Well, like we talked about a few months ago, I stopped checking the comments on that channel. So that's that's uh, the reason I have so stopped you... blocking accounts. On that OK, channel. OK. But uh, I was like I said to him, I said, well, you know, like. I think that's a pretty mild swear and like, you know, you as a parent have to make your decision, but I'm not going to like censor myself to that degree. But I linked him to a service that will like, I don't know how it works, but it basically automatically censors swear words out of YouTube videos. I was like, here, try this. Maybe this will work for you. So, oh, bullshitting. That's the word I was avoiding saying. This is a little BS before the stream starts. Um, I went to a race yesterday. Uh, I, 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 I'm so, it's a, so, so cool to be able to get out. I love going to races. I am, I think of myself first and foremost as a freestyle pilot, just cause that's just how I, I, I identify as a freestyle pilot, you know, <laughs> uh, I identify as an attack helicopter <laughs> now. Um, but I love every time I go to races and I was decent. I was pretty, I, I'll say myself, especially given how little I practice racing, I was uh, going into the brackets. So at the end of qualifying, I was in 10th-ish place out of like 35 people. And there was like, uh, you know, there was, there, I was, I was pretty happy with that, you know, uh, I'll show you guys some footage that uh, Kevin Turner, that's uh, for those again who don't know, that's Evan Turner's father, who's a great guy. With a son like Evan, how could he not be? Well, uh, he shot some footage, <laughs> so we'll share that. <laughs> and thanks also to Armando Gallegos, who set it up, who he did all the technical stuff for running the race. Just a great, great setup. Look at that power loop. Well, that was in the cleanest one. This was actually my, my, I, I, see, 10th place, right there, you can see, 10th place. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. 
Um, I have to say thank you uh, to Kevin Turner. Kevin Turner said, he said, there's a race on Saturday. Do you want to come? I will bring tiny trainers for you to fly because he knew my tiny trainers were broken. How serious I look. He said, I will bring tiny trainers for you to fly. All you have to do is show up and I'll hand you quads and you can fly them. And I was like, if dude is going to set me up with an offer like that, I will 100% take it. Because he knows a lot of times I get bogged down in, in stuff and don't make it out to a race for whatever reason. Oh. Anyway. Yeah, so I had a great time, and I want to say thank you to, uh, well, everybody who put on the race. Uh, there were many people involved in setting up the race and putting it on, but a special thank you to Kevin Turner, who uh, was like, just, he was like, do you want to come? And I was like, oh, my tiny trainers are broken. I whine, 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 whine. And he was like, just show up, and I'll make it happen for you. And and that's a, that's a, that's a good friend right there. Um why didn't I use HD zero? Ian F asks, because like I just said, Kevin Turner was just like, here, here are some tiny trainers I have laying around, fly them. And that's what he they had analog. So, um, mm. and it was really cool meeting all the people who were out there as well. Um, uh, yeah, really cool. Uh, meeting the folks out there and just, uh, having a good time racing. Um, I also want to shout out, uh, I give a little shout out to a fella. His name is Andre, and he sent me a, uh, a patch, and he sent me this sticker, which uh, says Putin Yidi Najui. Najui? Uh, and I don't know what that means, but thank you for the sticker. Really appreciate it. Uh, uh, it was very, very, he also sent me a couple of the little uh, gifts and it was really nice to get him. I just wanted to shout him out and say, thank you. Okay. So then let's get on with the questions. Here's how it's going to work. Um, uh, you guys will ask questions in the YouTube chat and in the discord. Blunty will cue the questions up and I will answer them. And if you want to be sure to get a question answered, you'll hit the dollar sign down here and leave a super chat. And uh, uh, I will uh, read those at about at about the half hour mark. I'll start reading super chats, but we'll take some non-super chats in the meantime. Um, let's start. Let's start with the technical question. Um... Let's see here. Well, that's not super technical, but it'll do. What do you think about Open IPC? Open IPC. Uh, for those who don't know, Open IPC is an alternative open firmware for your IP camera. Uh, and the reason it's exciting is that people have started doing People have started doing FPV setups. Here we go. This one from two days ago by Mario FPV is probably the most, the, the current state of the art, although it's developing fast. Uh, sorry, Mario, I'm going to turn your audio off so I don't uh, play any music that might get me in trouble. Um, this is a really impressive setup. Look how small it is, right? And the idea is that there is this firmware we can run on it that basically turns it into an FPV video transmitter. Pretty impressive. Uh, getting it working is fairly technical. Uh, and people are asking, well, Bard will make some content about this. And I, I keep thinking, maybe it's time for me to make content about this. And then they keep making it easier to use and better. And I go, okay. I look at the setup instructions and I go, oh, this is this is super technical. Like even if I make a tutorial that's as easy to follow as I can possibly make it, like only five people are gonna freaking follow it. And so I think to myself, you know what? 
when it gets just a little easier to use, maybe that'll be the time to make a tutorial about it. And then it keeps getting easier to use. And I'm like, uh, so uh, eventually I think the day will come, but it's pretty exciting. So as you can see, it is fairly technical to get it going. Well, not for everybody, but for some people. And the physical form factor is kind of jank. <laughs> it's kind of jank. It's definitely not ready for prime time. But the real question that everybody has is, how is the performance of OpenIPC? And here, now you want to, I want to, I want to warn you guys that you're looking at a YouTube video, which is already degraded quality. And now you're looking at me restreaming a YouTube video, which is degraded on top of degraded. So if you really want to see, ideally you would get your hands on some original footage that you could look at, but it would be better to go to Mario FPV's video. And here's the trick. If you don't know this trick, you must, you must change the quality manually to the highest quality. Now, in this case, it's already at 1080p 60, so we're good to go. But like, sometimes I'll upload content in 4K just so you can get the maximum quality possible, even if it's not 4K content, especially if you guys are watching a camera review or anything where the video image quality matters, always turn the resolution up as high as it can go. Even if you're not watching on a 4K screen, you will get a better looking, more representative image by telling YouTube that you want 4K, okay? So always do that. In this case, 1080p is the best we can get. So we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at that. Yeah, that tip, that tip, oh, like engrave that in your brain. Cause so many people I think watch a camera review and they don't know that like YouTube on their phone is giving it to them in 720p or even 1080p is not the best and you're not seeing the actual quality of the camera as much as you could. And frankly, like, like if this was like a new DJI or walk snail camera, I might be like a little critical and go, nah, I don't know. But like for what it is, it's, it's pretty good. Like it's not awful, right? I don't know. Yeah, but the big question Sebi D asks is what's the latency? What's the latency? And I've actually like wondered that myself. I don't know, 1200 milliwatt output power. So like you can see here, it's not as good as DJI, duh. Like there's a lot of detail being lost here. It's, I would wager to say it's not as good as walk snail, but we'd have to do a side by side. But for how small it is and how inexpensive it is, it's pretty freaking impressive. And it can probably get better over time. And it's just good to have more options. Anybody know the latency though? Has anybody tested the latency? So I, this is where I wanna be very critical. Go, okay. Blunty. The only problem oh. I have with the presentation of what we've seen so far is that he continues to say in comments on his pages on the community post that this is 35 milliseconds of latency. So that is on a bench test with a GPU running as the VRX is my understanding. So, oh God, what's currently not, running as the we VRX? Have not, we have not seen, my understanding is we have not seen testing that's proper testing at any range, with any consistency, with any breakup statistics, with anything like that. It's just that on a desk, the best you can get is around 35 milliseconds. But well, I want to be that, clear about that. But, but, okay, but just on principle, I'll play devil's advocate and argue with you a little. Yeah. Although I fundamentally, I appreciate the points you're making. Uh, DJI, v Cadex Vista, DJI, in high quality mode is about 30, 35 milliseconds on the bench. And then it gets higher when you go fly around. So is the, obviously the image quality isn't comparable, but everybody tests DJI latency on the bench and it's sort of understood and unspoken. And some people don't even realize that it gets worse when you go fly. And I do think that people need to make that point more so, overtly. Yeah. I think the thing is like, right, DJI can keep a 32, 35 to 42 or whatever it is in low latency, right? And there's a range, but the, mm -hmm. we, we don't know this range. And one of the big things we saw with Walksnail early on was Walksnail was saying like 35 and then mm -hmm. Walksnail was spiking to like, what, like a hundred or something? Like it was, it was having big, it was, they were like showing an average, but it was having big spikes. 
Yeah, so like I think, yeah, we just need to make sure we're not assuming that we have great steady latency at 35 because I see a lot of people using 35 millisecond latency as a number to compare to DJI and Walkstone currently, and that's not like even close to where we're at. Well, so let's all just rein it back in, but, right? But you said he's using a desktop GPU as the VRX. What is the VRX that's being used right now? Do we know? I'm not sure. I know what there's different he... solutions because obviously you can do, he doesn't there's... have goggles. Yeah. Hmm. Here we've got uh, Mario FPV showing a VRX with H.265. Hang on. Let's look at that in a second. Does he have any latency numbers in this video? Onboard DVR. Oh, God. A lot of jello there. That's too bad. It's probably not the camera's fault, potentially. But I just like, if you haven't done testing, we can't use latency numbers for anything. That's all that I mean, right? Well, and like you it, need to do you need to do actual glass to glass latency with a sp slow mo camera like Chris Rosser and Mads Tech do. I mean, I've seen that. I've seen that. I, uh, uh, John Goblin in our Discord has been running it on his own setup and has seen thirty five yeah. to forty two as his lowest latency. Okay, so and that is on that under glass to glass. And that is that with uh, let's see, test it. Now here he's got. Here he's got a ah. Come on, no more testing. I want to see the damn thing. He's got a VRX that he's built onto the front of the goggles. What? Okay, here we go. What is the VRX? 3D printed case. Very nice, clean print. Uh, looks like a Raspberry Pi type device. Is that a Raspberry Pi? Open IPC VRX. I don't know if it's a Raspberry Pi specifically. It's some kind of microcomputer. It is a Raspberry Pi, says EMU Lamer. And is the latency the same with the Raspberry Pi doing the decoding as with like a desktop GPU? Don't know. Um, one of the weaknesses of these systems historically has been that you, they use Wi-Fi adapters as their radio chipset. And that's not actually that different from what DJI and Walksnail do, but DJI and Walksnail are doing some deep they're they're modifying the way that the the uh, RF adapter transmits. It's not Wi-Fi at the Phi and at the data link layer. And usually these open source projects uh, don't have access to the code, and they're basically doing Wi-Fi uh, to transmit data, which is all digital video is. And that means that they don't get optimal uh, latency and so forth. Now I don't know if that's true for Open IPC or not. Uh, but it is a thing that has been an issue in the past. No, we don't. I don't see any latency measurements here, but that VRX certainly is interesting. Very low and consistent. Where is the latency? There's not one in any range. There's never a range latency. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't yeah. exist. He says the latency is very low and consistent, but is that just based on flight feel? Um, so I looked up John Goblin that I was talking about in our Discord, one of our no yeah. in the Discord. He tested on an orange Pi 5 Plus to get the 35 to 42 milliseconds he's seeing. He said 42 is consistent and sometimes dips down to 34 in his testing. That's not great, but it could be And that's better. on a bench, yeah. uh, glass to glass, but yeah. The, 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 all of these projects, it seems like they are waiting for them to reach a level of maturity and, and sort of public interest where it's worth somebody actually, you know, making a VRX and VTX with custom silicone or an SOC that's optimized for performance. Uh, and then they, they potentially will take a great leap in performance, but it seems like they don't reach the point where it's worth it for someone to do that. And so they never like fully, they're always held back by their hardware a little bit. Um, yeah. Interesting. I it's interesting. I think the main thing is like, you know, he showed that custom board with camera that we looked at the first video, right? So if he releases that in a time frame that makes sense, if the price mm -hmm. makes sense and the product's pre flash when you get it, mm -hmm. then the question is like, will the VRX sell at the same time? Will that be pre flash What will that look like? You know, like mm -hmm. I was trying to dig up info and even John wasn't sure, like, is there bi-directional communication? What happens when you get real breakup? Like yeah. how many blocks are encoded? He was saying he was seeing it black out totally. You know, so I'm just curious, like, how all those, like, we take for granted a lot of the things we get from things like DJI and Walksnail, oh, right? I the retransmissions and the holding I things and the compression, granted. the compression in line. I think a lot of the the people do, though. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, the, no, they're I'm doing a lot of magic hell. in there, right? Yeah, so. for sure. Well, anyway, uh, that is, so my take is this. Um, most of the time when I make a video, 
one of the factors that I put into making the video is how many people is it going to help? And that's not necessarily directly proportional to the view count. Like my, my beginner learn to fly videos in terms of popularity and view count do not get as many views as like a product review of a new hot product, which is going to get four or five times as many views as, as a learn to fly video. But I feel good about making the learn to fly videos because I feel like I hear from people who say, oh yeah, it, I, I was, I learned to fly using your videos. And that, that's, that uh, is very gratifying to me. Um, in terms of a video like this, I think at a point where it is still very early in its development and not at its full potential and also extremely technical and difficult to set up, like the number of people it will help is low because not that many, many, many people are just happy to fly whatever they're flying, DJI, Walksnail, Analog, HC0, they don't really care. And then of the people who might be interested in it, a lot of them are going to be put off by this, the number of hoops you have to jump through to get it working. And so I think I still want to wait a little bit before I like test it out and try it out. Um, also, I just look at the number of hoops you have to jump through and I'm personally annoyed. So I'm like, ah, I don't want to do this. But that's just my take on it today. I'm sure that I will visit it at some point. Um, yeah, Scott Arrow says, I guess you can have pet project videos that will never get max figures if you can balance it out with the crowd pleasers. Yeah, like my rotor hazard video is also super technical and relatively few people will benefit from it because relatively few people run races. But I think like when I, it's like there's nobody who makes a lap timer. I hear from so many people who, who race and they're like, how can I get a lap timer? So it's clear to me that there's sort of a desperate need for this service and I'm happy to sort of fill it. I'm not sure that's true with open IPC though. I think a lot of people are, are happy with what they've got. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the next question. We'll take a couple more questions and then we'll do super chats. Remind me, uh, sorry, no, Kermit FPV says, I have put WTFOS onto my V1 and when I use the Fusion, the uh, text blocks the screen. Um, you gotta go into the TBS Fusion menu and turn off their OSD. The, in the TBS Fusion module, there's options to change the OSD, to move it around or turn it on or off. And that's what you need to do. Or you need to move your Betaflight OSD so it's not overlapping. That's the answer. Simple answer, but uh, that's what it is. Um, let's see. Ghost Branch, one more question from Ghost Branch about OpenIPC. Does it have a chance of becoming for video links what ExpressLRS became for control links? Um, so Ghost Branch, in, from one perspective, the answer to that is yes, because OpenIPC is open. And that's one of the key characteristics that makes ExpressLRS so popular. But there's two things that makes ExpressLRS popular. One is that it's open and anyone can implement hardware. And that means lots of vendors implement hardware. And, and that means there's, there's it's never out of stock. ExpressLRS is never out of stock. There's always somebody who's making ExpressLRS hardware that's in stock and it's beautiful. It also drives price down because there's co price competition, which isn't true for things like Ghost or Crossfire. But the flip side of that is that the other the other thing that ExpressLRS has is that it has amazing performance. So when a person chooses ExpressLRS, they're not really having to compromise. Well, the compromise is that it's kind of complicated to use and there's a learning curve, which some people don't find to be a big deal and other people do. But in terms of performance, you're not giving anything up. It's just like a win, 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 win. With OpenIPC, it, it currently is open source and that means that theoretically we could see hardware being made for it. And a lot of the technical setup issues could go away, but then it also has to deliver better performance. And also it has to be priced competitively because that's gonna be one of the advantages that people look for in an open uh, video system. And I don't think it has been demonstrated to have better performance yet. So it has potential, but only if the performance gets to a point where it is close enough to the alternative that, that it's compelling. Uh, here's a question from Remind Me to Build who asks, what are the disadvantages to using 900 megahertz ELRS over 2.4 gigahertz? 
You type two. You type two point five gigahertz. I think he meant two point four though. Because uh, anyway, disadvantages of nine hundred megahertz. Number one, bigger antennas, more of a pain in the ass. It's a small thing. On a five inch quad, the size of a nine hundred megahertz antenna is fairly substantial. Well, it doesn't matter. People flew crossfire for years, and the antennas got chopped up and got in the way, and it was a little annoying. But meh. If you fly seven inches or 10 inches or big flying wings, the size of the 900 megahertz antenna is an issue. You got a million places you could put it. But on smaller quads, it's a little bit of an issue. Um, 900 megahertz express LRS tops out at, I think it's 200 hertz. So if you are concerned about racing and you want the lowest possible latency, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. 2.4 gigahertz is going to give you up to 1,000 hertz, much lower latency. Uh, a difference in latency of something like 15 or 18 milliseconds. I'm not exactly sure about the number, but that's the ballpark for 200, 250 hertz express LRS. Uh, whereas 1000 hertz is down in the sub two millisecond latency range. So that's pretty that's a pretty substantial reduction. Um, and to, I think the final disadvantage would be that there is less 900 megahertz hardware out there. So you're going to be more limited in what hardware you can choose. Okay. Um, uh, let me take this one more question. Um, it's Joey Lowe asks, uh, are you going to revisit the MT-12 and fix the broken setup? Uh, let's see, Joey. What, like I know that uh, I changed the channel order. So it is correctly one to turn and two to burn. And I changed the special function that locks out the throttle so it correctly locks. Because when I first changed the channel order, the, the lockout was working on the steering. Oops. I fixed that. Is there Joey, is there something else that's broken about the custom setup? If so, uh, go ahead and email me about that. Did you already email me about that? There's one outstanding issue that I still have. MT12. Was it you who emailed me about it? That would be hilarious, Joey. Uh, no, maybe it's in my other inbox. MT12. Uh, oh no, that's Brandon Posey. So Brandon Posey sent me an email a couple days ago saying that there's an issue uh, that the LED functions are not working correctly. So I have to check that. Is there something else wrong with it, Joey? If so, the best thing for you to do is email me, uh, jb at joshuabardwell.com and let me know, and I will get that updated. Yeah, so it was fully working when I released it, and then people were like, the channel channels are reversed. Channel 1 and Channel 2 should be swapped. And I tried to fix that, but then in fixing that, I broke something else, and I thought I had it all working, but... Maybe I don't. So let me know. Um, okay, time for Super Chats. And we're going to start. We have so many cute questions. I, I feel bad going to Super Chats. But I have to go to Super Chats because these people paid. They paid. So I get their messages read by me. It's only fair. Um, Kestrel FPV, thank you for a $50 Super Chat. It was an honor to meet you at yesterday's race. Oh, well, the honor was all mine. Um, it uh, It's always good to meet folks uh, when I go out uh, and uh, put faces to names. Um, well, <laughs> uh, you've taught me so much in the last five years and appreciate everything you bring to the hobby. It was super cool to see you race. Well, I'm, I uh, was super cool to get out and race. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your donation. Very generous. Um uh, got it one from El Chingon. Thank you for five dollars, El Chingon, and he says thank you for helping me with the endpoints issue via messages a few weeks ago. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. C Joe says thank you for five dollars. C Joe, you mentioned previously people trading Grateful Dead tapes in college. Were you a dead head? Um, I don't. I don't know if I would like call myself a dead head. I can't remember if I would have called myself a dead head when I was. It was before I went to college. It was probably my junior or senior year in, in high school. So I would have been 17, I guess, 
maybe, uh, maybe 18. I can't remember the exact timeline. I went to work at this bike shop, a bicycle shop. Um, I, I was riding mountain bikes. I was riding bikes at the time. That was one of my hobbies. And I would go into the bike shop and, uh, uh, you know, you know, just hang out, buy, buy stuff for my bike, get my bike worked on and meet up there for, for going out for rides. And, um, uh, they hired me because their inventory was all effed up. And it turns out their inventory was effed up because everyone in the bike shop was stealing all the time. The owner of the bike shop was this rich guy who rode bikes. And he was basically an absentee owner. He like wanted to own a bike shop because he was into riding bikes, but he like n never was in the shop. And, and, the, and the, the manager of the shop uh, basically ran the whole thing. And the manager of the shop hired all his stoner friends to work in the shop. And they would like just steal things like they would just sell things off the shelf and keep pocket the money or do it in exchange for like put you put a car stereo in my car. I'll let you take this bike out the door. And, you know, as I'm telling the story as a grown adult, it sounds like uh, it's horrifying. But, you know, at the time it was just like, ah, who gives a fuck? <laughs> um, and they hired me because uh, the owner was like, hey, we need to get our inventory straightened out. And so they had to do a complete inventory of the store. And they they didn't know how to use their, 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 like their computer, their cash register system. They didn't know basically how to do the inventorying. And I was like a computer nerd. Still am, but I was. And um, so they were like, hey, can you come like f help us fix the inventory? And I was like, sure. Uh, so they hired me, they taught me how to work on bikes, uh, <laughs> and introduced me to the Grateful Dead and some other things that I won't say on stream because, uh, we're trying to keep it family friendly. And, uh, yeah, so I went to a couple dead shows when they came through Atlanta and, uh, you know, listened to the dead for a while and, you know, that was, that was a good time. eventually the shop, the shop closed down before I went to college because I stopped working there when I went to college. I moved away from that town and moved to Atlanta uh, where I went to Georgia Tech. And I remember the shop closed down. So that probably helps narrow down the time frame. And uh, when the word, when the word came that the shop was closing, uh, we also learned that we would not be getting our last paychecks, which to be fair, everyone had been stealing a lot. So, that, I mean, I, I, for the record, I didn't steal. I was a good boy. Um, I wasn't a full-time employee and I just, I didn't, I didn't really have any input into sales decisions. I worked on bikes. I was, I was way too young to try to like sell. And so I, you know, I was, I was never given the opportunity to steal. Occasionally the manager would be like, yeah, you can have that. Go ahead, take that. And like, for me, that was not me stealing so much as it was him stealing. <laughs> it was his decision to make. But when, uh, when we learned that the store was closing, it was just like one day we all came into work and it was like, Hey, the store's going to close. Nobody's going to get paid. So, uh, it was basically a free for all to try and make up for your missing paycheck. Uh, and then I did steal, but only as much as I felt I was owed for the work I had done. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> a little history from me and uh, and the Grateful Dead. Um, let's see here. We got a super chat here from Studio 8. Thank you for five euros. What's the best way to mount a Radio Master Bandit BR3 antennas on the iFlight Helion? Helion. Helion. I bet that's supposed to be Helion. Like from Hell, Helion or Helion. Lion. That's a great little play on words, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't know. But this is the kind of question where I just kind of want to be like, I don't know. Use your freaking imagination. I don't know. You're trying to, you're trying to stick a thing to the other thing. What do you need my advice for? Just stick the thing on the thing, right? 
How many ways are there to stick the thing on the thing? You got a thing, you need it to be on the thing, you stick it on the... Maybe, maybe you 3D print, so I don't know, you just stick the thing on the thing. You gotta spend five euros for me to tell you how to stick the thing on the thing. So just fucking, freaking stick the thing. No, okay, fine. Um, does it have standoffs that I can use? Does it have accessible standoffs in the rear? Because my first thought, no, way to go, iFlight. Way to go, iFlight. Um, so my first thought would be to use like uh, one of uh, License to Drive's mounts, but they assume, they assume that your quadcopter has standoffs, which is an entirely reasonable assumption, except iFlight's gotta make everything fancy. Oh, we're so fancy. We look like a freaking sea creature with fins and spikes, but no standoffs. So good luck mounting your antenna. F you. This whole thing is a giant F you. Okay, I'm, I'm getting I carried away. I'm getting quick. carried away. I'm getting I just, carried away. I, I, I just oh. want to agree, though. Because, like, oh, wow. you know I how many that. people get these binding flies and then they're like, I don't know where the receiver's plugged in or we have to look up the guides. No, they're all afraid to open it. Every every person is afraid to open it because it's not just like five screws, ten screws, eight screws on a top plate, whatever, you know? Yeah. No. That, yeah. So frustrating. Yeah, but it's got this cool just lift up plate, right, Plenty? It just opens up like a car hood, I guess. Like it looks like this is a hinge here. And here we got some screws. I'm guessing you take these screws out. The hinge lifts up, right? That makes sense. Where the frick are you going to mount your receiver? Where's the freaking stock receiver antenna mounted? Where do they mount it? Oh, here it is. Under the front. Well, that's not the worst thing for a... For a long range, mounting under the front isn't bad. Because it means that when you're flying away from yourself, you turn around to come home and that's going to give you slightly better coverage versus worse coverage. Uh, it looks like it is... That's stupid. It's mounted up, up above the top plate, the bottom plate. It's inside, which is okay for a 900 megahertz antenna that hangs out the side, but it's not good for a 2.4 gig antenna that will be entirely inside. So what I would do, to be honest with you, what I would do, it's clear that the receiver is mounted in the front, and just that's to, prob you're probably going to follow that. Yeah. Just to be clear, he's asking about a 900 megahertz antenna. Oh, well, good. That's where you should mount it. Thank you for thank you for that. Yeah, that's where you should mount it. We're right here. Exactly like iFlight does from the factory. That's the answer. Oh, he said the RPO three. He said the RPO three. Isn't that a is that a is that some nine hundred megahertz? No, he said Radio Master Bandit BR three antenna. Oh my bad. My bad. I thought he said RPO three. Yeah, mount it like this. Mount it just like Radio Master does. I mean uh iFlight does. If you really want to improve things, mount it on the arm, crosswise on the arm. Abra the Ham suggests that vertical mounting would be preferable. I see what you're getting at, Aber. I mean, a lot of people mount this way. The problem with this mounting is that as you turn the null, the antenna has a null coming off the end of the wire. The null will point at you, and if you're at long range, you'll fail safe. So the BR3 is actually a diversity. So one on each arm? Or how would you do it? If it's diversity, I 1,000% would want vertical mounting. Like, for my opinion, for long range, the best mounting is a plus configuration. Horizontal and vertical, and then you've got all your bases covered. There is uh, no obvious way to do the vertical mount here because again we got no standoffs we got no we'd have to improvise something but i probably would put the vertical one like here again on the front the other way you could try to do it is front and rear but the problem is you need a really long in ufl cable to get to the rear and it's usually not the right way to do it So I would try to like zip tie or something it to here and have it be vertical. Yep. And then you got your bases covered. All right. 
All right, good question. Mayank Jonega, Joneja, Joneja. Thank you for 400 uh, rupees, and I apologize for mangling your name. Uh, my F4 AIO 5 amp Express LRS flight controller keeps overheating on my new Meteor 75X Pro build within one minute of flying. Any tips? I've zip tied my VTX to the hood, and I'm using fresh motors and batteries. I'm going to guess. So, my young, I'm going to guess that you're getting the overheat warning, but nothing actual bad is happening. So, here's the solution to that. I'll show you right here in Betaflight. What you do, come on, come on. What you do is you go into the OSD tab and you go on the right hand side. You go here, hold on. On the right hand side and you go down to warnings here we go warnings right and you go to core temperature and you turn it off and you will never see the core temperature warning again problem solved but wait you say is it my flight controller overheating i don't know maybe it's, I've never had it be an issue. Some flight controllers run hot and they trigger the core temp warning. Personally, I've never had it actually cause a problem. And he, I just think the beta flight core temperature warning is a little hyperactive. Go ahead, Blinty. He responded in chat there if you want to check that out. Oh, fuck. Sorry, parents. What did he say in chat? Something, it, it flips out and the temp climbs to 90 degrees once I get the warning. So if it flips out... If it literally flips, I can't think of what that would be other than a bad flight controller. Like you, you correctly guessed that your VTX might be causing it because the VTX also gets hot. So you correctly guessed that relocating your VTX might be the right thing to do. And if it's still overheating, I, I don't know what to tell you. If it's overheating to the point where, it, and you're flying, so it's getting airflow. Like you've done everything right. So, I, that, I can't think of what to do other than replace the flight controller. Plenty, I'm so glad to have you in the comments. <laughs> Sometimes I see you managing comments and I'm like, um, it's, those are the things I would say, except I'm not managing comments, I'm reading. I'm, I'm managing this. I'm like, I, I'm on the stream. Like that comment from, it's a comment from Ghost Dog where he's like, why don't you talk about open IPC? It's so good. And you're like, we just talked about it for 15 minutes. Rewind the DVR. Oh, choice. <laughs> Maxime Boggs, thank you for a $2 super chat. Let me just see, Maxime, if uh, you have a question here. Yeah, you do. What could I troubleshoot why my JBQ AVS2 analog build feels sluggish and slow and prop wash the roof after my first couple flights. So Maxime, uh, do you mean that it used to fly good and now after a couple flights it's sluggish? And now we have to wait for an answer, but I'm curious. Or has it always flown sluggish? And then the other question was, did you crash it during your first few flights? Answer those two questions, Blunty, if you keep an eye on the chat uh, for the answer. I'm going to go on to the next question, and we'll come back to this one. Um, how is the FX88D for my first soldering iron? Heck, well, it's a Heiko. Hacko, Heiko. So how do you say that word? I say Hacko. It feels like Heiko might be right. Um, the Heiko as a company, now I'm going to feel self-conscious every time I say it. They just make great soldering irons. There are two companies that can be absolutely relied on to make great soldering irons. They're Heiko and and Weller or or Weller, Weller, Weller. It's German, I assume. Uh, both of them make amazing soldering irons. There are probably other companies who also make good soldering irons. I just don't know their names off the top of my head. So essentially, any Heiko soldering iron is going to be good. 
Um, this is the exact soldering iron I have owned for almost 10 years now. Uh, the only sort of argument against this one is that some people prefer like an analog dial to turn the temperature up and down instead of digital button presses. Okay. But this is a, 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 a just a lifetime soldering iron. It's a fantastic soldering iron. Uh, I have not had to replace the heating element. I have not had to replace any part of it, except occasionally I wear out the tip eventually. I think I've gone through like one tip. I'm on my on my second tip in 10 years. It's just a fantastic soldering iron, and I absolutely love it. Um, not to say that it's the only one out there or that there aren't any better, but to say that if you are inclined to get this one, you will not be making a mistake. You know, that's what I would say. It's a great soldering iron. All right, there you go. We get any answers back from Maxime yet? Uh, wait, oh, I see. Wait a minute, Plenty. I just realized something. Dude, I've got this filter on his name, which means that when he answers, boom, it just is pulled up. I never noticed that before says, yes, it was good and fast, and I did crash, but I repaired it as well as the original build. So, Maxime, um, if it was good and fast, and you crashed, and now it's not good and fast, like, the likely diagnosis is that something was damaged in the crash that you have not repaired. So, like... <coughs> excuse me. Ah. Uh, oh, man. Oh, it's coming. It's coming back. Oof, I've been I've been almost healthy for like a week. And now it's just time. It's probably time for me to get sick again. Um, like, for example, if you damaged a motor and didn't, you might not like notice that the motor was obviously damaged. But if the motor was like slightly sluggish or damaged, that could cause this problem. <laughs> right. But if it used to fly good and then at, and then like you crashed and now it doesn't fly good, the crash is the likely cause. This is a really basic troubleshooting principle because people will say, uh, my quadcopter used to fly fine. I crashed and now it flies bad. What should I do to fix it? I tried reflashing the flight controller, changing the PIDs, modifying the ESC firmware. I tried all these things, but if you crashed, and now it flies bad, flashing your flight controller isn't the problem. Something broke when you crashed. And I know that sounds obvious when I say it, but I can't tell you how often people try to fix a physical, a broken hardware with, with software fixes. And like, if you have a damaged motor that's desyncing, you could put a bandage on it and like put a, a crutches on it by changing your ESC firmware, but you haven't fixed the problem. The right thing to do is to f replace the damaged part or repair it. So, so that's my thought. But I, uh, my guess, my guess would be it's a damaged motor that you've overlooked. Mm. Okay, more uh, continuing our super chats. Oh, I was not on the right camera the whole time I was talking. That's okay, I guess. Detailed question in Discord about battery internal resistance. Thank you, uh, Griff, Gr Gr H, whoever Gray hat. you are. I Gray had it queued up. Hat. Yeah, you had it queued, and I may, I do mean to get to it, but since now we're in the Super Chats, I'll go ahead and, and grab it, since he's also Super Chatted. Thank you for your generosity, Gray Hat. I can't read those things. Gray Hat. I'm not elite enough to read those things. Um, so if I take it off here and I go up here and I click here, there we go. Gray Hat says, I bought some high quality 6S100 Ma, 100, 100, 1000 Ma, right? He means 1000 Ma, right, Blunty? Or does he mean 100 Ma? Gray Hat. Yes, he means 1000. He means 1000. You thousand. mean 1000, right? Just confirm me. 100 Ma is like a whoop pack. There's no such thing as a 6S100 Ma. Gray Hat. Do you mean 1,000 ma? Can we just confirm that? Okay, well, I'll keep reading. They were measuring over 30 and up to 40 milliohms IR after a full charge. They're supposedly 100, 200 C. Yeah, 1,100. Okay, great. 
After watching your video, I decided to return them. There were some other opinions from trusted people saying, I eh, keep them and send them. I'm not looking for you to disagree with anybody. Thank you. It's courteous of you to respect the people who answered your question. Sometimes you want a second opinion, but it can often sound like you're like disbelieving. And that's, that's, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm curious if you would personally be happy with a $50 to $5 success pack that came with over 30 million ohms per cell. Um, yeah, I agree that if you, if you flew the packs, like, how are they going to know you flew them? But if you flew the packs, then it would be harder to return them. And I would probably, I'm not sure if I would personally return a pack solely based on the IR. And I say that because I, I, I don't necessarily check the IR of every pack I buy as soon as I buy it. Usually I'll just charge it up and send it. And then if it performs badly, I'll go, oh, so what's going on here? And I'll check the IR. Um, but if I did uh, like a 6S 1000 Ma with 30 to 40 milliohms, that it should be like around 15 milliohms. Maybe, 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 maybe. So I, I wouldn't think it would be higher than 20 milliohms. Now you said that you measured the internal resistance when they were fully charged, which is correct. You thought that's correct because the internal resistance goes down as they come up to charge. And the only way to measure internal resistance is at 4.2 volts per cell. That's the standard. The, but there's one thing you didn't mention, which is temperature. And I, I have to wonder if the battery's temperature was controlled for. Temperature has a big effect on internal resistance. Now, I'm going to guess that you were just in your house and your house is at room temperature. And so probably, but like if they, let's, let's, let's imagine. Let's imagine that you live somewhere where it's winter right now. The batteries get delivered to your house. So they're sitting out on your porch or out on your stoop or whatever in your mailbox. And it's it's cold and the batteries are cold. And you bring them in your house, you pop them on the charger and you charge them up and they're reading 40. They haven't come to temp yet. The batteries need to sit for three or four hours maybe in inside before they will fully like the temperature come to temperature. So like theoretically temperature could be causing that uh five to six hours inside okay so it sounds like you did everything right at that point i i don't think you were wrong to return them like i also wouldn't think you would be wrong to just fly them but like that's that's not that doesn't seem right to me i also would question whether the tool you've got measuring internal resistance is accurate because like every charger that measures internal resistance is going to give a slightly different value. And you kind of, it's kind of like, who do you trust? Right. But it is important to know that if you and another person are measuring internal resistance, or even if you have two different chargers and you're measuring internal resistance, that they're going to give slightly different numbers and you can't necessarily compare them. <sighs> Uh, so what I would say is like, since they were expensive batteries and since like for $60 a pack, I would probably send them back. I, I'm not going to, if they're going to take them back, I'd be like, nah, like why take chances with batteries that expensive? Yep. Especially given that, you know, you can get good sub 20 million packs for way less than that. That being said, internal resistance is not the be-all, end-all of battery performance, but it is important and relevant. Uh, Sunshine. I'll go ahead and take Sunshine's question as well uh, before we continue with the Super Chats. Sunshine says, I just upgraded my LiPo charger and now it shows internal resistance in real time while you're charging. And Sunshine shows a, uh, a photo here of what that looks like. Uh, what are some like normal numbers? Okay, so again, you need to know that the internal resistance number is meaningless until you reach the end of the charge cycle. Okay. It's, it, it is being measured and that number reflects the battery's current internal resistance, but because internal resistance depends on state of charge, the standard is to measure internal resistance at full charge. So this doesn't mean anything. 
These numbers will go down as the battery comes up to charge. Um, but but other than that, it doesn't tell us very much. He says, my 1300 milliamp hour cells are showing 10 to 14 ohms while charging. Doesn't matter. It's what they're at at the end of the charge cycle. My 1500 milliamp hour about 17 to 20 ohms. Is there more resistance the more milliamp hours you have? No, the opposite. Larger cells will have lower internal resistance because they are more able to push the amps out of them. Larger cells, less internal resistance. So that's backwards. But they're different cells. So, you know, who knows? How do you measure internal resistance? You, it's hard to measure accurately. You, you have to draw a small amount of current from the battery and measure the voltage drop. You, you place a known load across the battery and based on the known load, you know how much current should flow. And then you measure how much current does flow. And that lets you calculate how much loss you've got in the internal resistance of the battery. And the problem is the internal resistance is in milliohms. So you need to be able to measure current very accurately and a very small amount of current. And the problem is that it's, it, it can, it's, that's, that's hard to calibrate. You need a very, very accurate current calibration. And, uh, so that's why there's so much variance as you measure internal resistance. He's asking how you actually check IR. It's the charger. Oh, just right? you use your charger will have an IR check function. Either the charger will automatically measure IR while you're charging. So in the middle of a charge cycle, you just roll the scroll wheel and it goes through the screens and one of the screens is the internal resistance. Or it'll have a dedicated IR check function, which I actually like that the latter because you can check IR at any time without having to start a charge cycle. Like if I've got a battery that's fully charged, how do I check its internal resistance? What I have to do is I have to change the stop voltage from 4.20 to 4.21, then start a charge cycle, and then wait 30 seconds or a minute for it to measure the IR. Whereas with, with some chargers I've had, there's just an IR check function that'll just check the IR right now without uh, doing any charge. So. Does IR change at all, depending on how many amperage you're putting into the battery? Mm -mm. No, I don't. Okay. I don't think so. It shouldn't. So I imagine that what the charger is doing, and I, I'm speculating here. I imagine that the charger is monitoring the effect that its charge is having on the battery voltage. Uh, and, uh, actually, I don't know. That would be hard to do. That would be hard to do. I don't know how it's doing it during charge. It's got to have a way of doing it. Like, it's not, like, it's not like stopping the charge and measuring the voltage and then starting the charge and measuring the voltage. Could that be what it's doing? Like, behind the scenes? It doesn't seem like it is. I, I don't know. I actually don't know how it measures voltage, uh, internal resistance during the charge cycle. So then I guess one other question a lot of people in chat, at least a few people asked was, if you charge your battery faster, will you get better IR at the end when you check it because you've heated up the cells? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So I haven't, I haven't experimentally tested that, but that checks out. It is a fact that higher temperature battery will have lower IR. And it is a fact that charging your battery faster will increase its temperature. Those two things are, are facts. Now, the degree to which that happens depends on a lot of other variables that we can't really quantify. But if you charge a battery at 5C, it will be hotter at the end of that charge than if you charge it at 1C. And therefore, the measured internal resistance will be lower, even if you're doing that in a room temperature room. So ideally to measure internal resistance, you would want to use a 1C charge rate so that you would get, you wouldn't increase the temperature of the battery very much. But the most important thing is that you are consistent. That's the most important thing. And that you realize that it is difficult to compare your IR numbers to somebody else's who isn't using your exact equipment and your exact tech, your exact protocols. 
Eagle FPV says, I thought LiPos should never get hot while charging. Well, they're going to warm up. Like hot versus warm. They're going to heat up while they charge. That's a fact. That just is a thing that happens. Anytime you're putting current into or taking current out of a battery, it heats up. And the reason it heats up is the internal resistance. When you push current through a resistor, the result is energy lost to heat. And the battery acts as if it has an internal resistance. Okay, continuing with the super chats. Good talk about internal resistance. Uh, what to buy after the Cetus X? Budget, not an issue. Thank you for $2, Josh. Budget, not an issue. My favorite three words. Um, so the question is, what do you want to buy? Do you want to buy a five-inch freestyle drone? Are you limited to tiny whoops? It really depends. Um, if you're looking for tiny whoops, something like a Mobula 6 or a Mob Mobula 7 is a good choice. Uh, if you're looking for like a three-inch freestyle drone... It's a good, you know what? Ooh, I got to get on the phone with uh, Limon. Damn, I forgot. I got to do that. Uh, to talk about, uh, I just upped, this is my website, fpvknowitall.com. fpvknowitall.com. Uh, and it's home of the ultimate FPV shopping list. Uh, and the reason I just, uh, side note, thought of, we just redid the whole racing page. Uh, I worked with uh, Ivan Efimov, Limon FPV, or Limon. He says not to put FPV after his name. Limon. Um, and we used the survey done by Sean Ames uh, from MultiGP to uh, you know take the actual equipment that people are using and put it on this page so we could recommend action. And not just that, but but at least that. And I want to sit down and do a video with him where we talk about the choices. I got to do that before the end of this week. Jeez. Um, but where I was going is this sub 250 gram page. If you're looking for like a three inch that's still under 250 grams, here are some choices. Um, if you're looking for a five inch, we can go straight to the five inch freestyle page and find some bind and flies there. If you decide to build your own, you could do my builds my build kit. Where I walk you through building your own drone. How's that doing? Let's see. 98,000 views. Not bad. These videos always do really well. Um, so yeah, there's various ways you could go. I think the first thing you gotta do is uh decide which direction you want to go. Um, Kumar asks, does FPV Know-It-All ship to India? Will there be a problem with custom duty? Kumar, FPV Know-It-All is not a store. FPV Know-It-All does not ship. Uh, FPV Know-It-All is a catalog of recommendations, and there are links to stores that sell things. Some of those stores may ship to India. I don't know. That's You'd have to take that up with the individual stores. Crosser tip asks uh thank you for two euros uh freestyle whoop meteor 75 pro or meteor 65 uh ah. no matter what i say i'm gonna piss people off um there are definitely people who like the pure tiny whoop experience of a 65 millimeter but i think that many people and i say this as someone who has shit on the 75 millimeter size before but I can, I'm also a guy who can see which way the wind is blowing. Every time I shit on 75 millimeter whoops, a lot of people argue with me and say I'm wrong. People who are way better whoop freestyle pilots than I am. So a lot of people would say that for freestyle, the extra power and weight of a 75 millimeter is very desirable and you'll get a, a more well-rounded freestyle experience with a 75 than a 65, which is just a little underpowered. So, so I think 75 is the way to go. Well, I think that that's what, that's what people who other people would suggest. You get better batteries. That's right, Chris. When you go up to those 450 milliamp hour packs, they're just better quality cells. 
It's just a little harder to fly a 75 indoors. You have to be a little better pilot, but I think a lot of people would tell you 75 is the way to go. Fly High FPV says India has made it illegal to import drone parts without a special permit, so stores will not ship to India. Yes, that is definitely part of it. Definitely. Uh, and Fly High FPV runs a store, so he would know. Fly High FPV runs flyhighfpv.com. Uh, uh, not as well known a store as some, but you know, definitely a solid contender and uh, very knowledgeable and very helpful guy. Um, source for source for some of the best. I mean, in addition to FPV gear, some of the best FPV swag that you can get, including FPV rolling papers. Okay, <laughs> well done, FPV rolling papers. Nice. Oh, what is this? Oh, that's cute. I mean, it's kind of a mess. I like it. What? How many drivers are in here? $22 for all that? No. I can't be right. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. It's just these four. I like the, I like this little 3D printed thing. That's, uh, that's good. I want just that 3D printed thing. Um, uh, my favorite is the, uh, is the shirts though. I love good shirts. This shirt, I have one of these shirts. It's really fun to wear. People think it's a Metallica shirt. I don't know how he hasn't gotten sued by Metallica yet, but I won't say anything if you won't. Anyway, Fly High FPV. The other thing Fly High FPV, in my, uh, perspective is I heard from a lot of stores that when they shipped to India, either the stuff didn't get delivered or it got sent back. And that's not just about the import ban, although now it's also about the import ban. It's just that apparently postal service in India is really wacky and not, well, anyway, I, I don't know. I don't want to say anything that would cause any Indians out there to feel defensive towards their postal service, which I'm sure is wonderful. But um, I heard from stores that they would, they just were like, we're not shipping to India because they had too many packages not get delivered to get returned. And then the customer wants their money back or is, is, is upset. And they were just like, F it, we're not doing it. So a lot of stores won't sue, uh, won't, uh, sorry, not sue, won't ship. Uh, I said sue because Fly FBV says Metallica sued me for 500 grand back in the Napster days. No, they didn't. Prove it. Prove it, Fly FBV. Show me the, show me the letter. I would, that would be hilarious. Um, continuing the super chats, we will try to catch up on these super chats and get back to the regular chats before the end of the stream. I usually succeed at that, but you guys are being so generous with the super chats. We're going to keep going. Uh, gray hat says I'm adding the HD zero light to mob seven can, or should I decase the camera? Uh, whenever building a, a ultra light tiny whoop, uh, the question is the trade off between weight and durability. Anytime you talk about decasing something, you're probably decreasing its durability. So it's just a question of whether that, whatever, 0 0.4 grams of weight is worth the change in durability to you. And that's a personal decision. I can't advise you on that. Um, Powers V2, thank you for a $5 super chat. Watch the new Zoe FPV 3D mode freestyle vivid. Any tips before I flash and explore her preset rabbit hole? Um... The only tip I would give you powers V2 is uh, practice 3D mode in the simulator first. The, it, it is it is a real mind melting brain tweak with, when you try to fly upside down. And like anything, it's good for you to get your first couple hundred crashes out of the way in the simulator so that you're not just crashing gear and wasting you know, obviously you can flip upside down and then fly up and flip back over. But at the minute you try to actually fly upside down, like all of your instincts are wrong and, and you should practice in the sim first. That's what I would say. Kermit FPV, thank you for 50 Norwegian kroner. Uh... Just, uh, just thank you, thank you for the donation. No question. Jacob Breezy FPV, thank you for five dollars. I got the F4 Nexo V2. What's your thoughts on it? Can I use it for a 6S build? 
F4 Nexo V2. I don't know what the hell that is. Uh, that is apparently a Hyundai. <laughs> no, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> what the hell is it? The F4 Nexo V2. What is it? What is the F4 Nexo V2? I have no idea. I guess it's a flight controller? Oh, Noxy V2. I bet that's it. Nox V2. Bingo. Did he, Did I misread it? No, I didn't misread it. Um, can you use it for a 6S build? Sure, it says it's rated for 6S. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the ESC is the thing that I would be more concerned about. The flight controller doesn't care. He's just going to get a VBAT. Doesn't really care. <laughs> Fly High FPV points out that this is one of his favorite shirts. <laughs> uh, I just hate Irish green. No. I just don't like green shirts. I don't like to wear green. Uh, that's really cute. That's really cute. That's that's absolutely garish. I'm usually like a, a heather gray or black guy. Anyway, that's that's fantastic. By the way, uh, this was done for those who are wondering. This was done with my permission. He did ask if he could use my likeness in such a disrespectful way. Because like, everybody knows I would never, I would never partake in such a way. Not now. Like when I worked for a, in a bike shop, maybe. No comment. <laughs> um, Uh, it's Joey Low. Joey Low says, this is to my express my gratitude for your help with the MT-12. I sent you an email you requested describing my experience. Thank you for a $20 super chat. I will take a look at that. Uh, the Evil Vargon says, I just burnt out four motors with two long screws. Do you do anything fun or useful with dead motors or just toss them in the trash? Thank you for five Canadian dollars. Um, Evil Vargon, if you take the bells off, they make cool little tops that you can spin. Like you just take the bell off and the shaft sticks out the bottom and you can spin them. And that's kind of fun. Um, they are magnetic, so like be a little bit aware of that fact that they have magnets on them. But mostly I just throw them out. Uh, the bells the bells are probably still usable as spare bells. If you buy more of the – that's actually the best idea. Don't throw them out. If buy four more of the same – because you destroyed the stator, but the bells are fine. Those are Those are good replacement bells. When you crash and break a bell, you can use those as spares. Um, Ma Le, thank you for uh, 100 uh, Czech Karuna, I think. How am I doing? Czech Karuna, woo! Thank you for 100 Czech Karuna. I lost connection to VTX during flight and I cannot connect or bind. Blue and green LEDs are flashing, red one is solid. Thanks for your help. Uh, so this is the walk snail video transmitter. Lost connection to VTX during flight. I don't know what those LEDs mean off the top of my head. The, if In this situation, uh, I would want to know whether the LEDs on the VTX are powering, are, are, are powering up. And it's not clear to me. You said blue and green LEDs, red LEDs, but where are the LEDs, right? Um... So I'd want to verify that the VTX was powering up. And if it was not powering up, I would get a multimeter out and test whether it's getting power. And if it was getting power and it still wasn't powering up, then it's, it's borked. There is no blue LED on walk snail. Yeah, but could the flight controller have like... Uh, green and red LEDs 
like what I'm wondering is whether the flight controller has a blue, red, and green LED and the Waxdale VTX is completely dead and not powered up at all. So, you said it happened during flight. Did it happen when you crashed or did it just spontaneously happen during flight? Socks and Rocks, thank you for a $10 super chat. There are unmanned vehicles with soft mounted motors out there. Just because you can filter noise from the gyro doesn't mean the frame isn't shaking the crap out of your RE Mini. What do you think? Yeah, the frame is shaking the crap out of my RE Mini. That's true. Um, I mean, soft-mounted motors, I don't think that the motor vibration is the primary thing that's shaking uh, my camera. Wait, RE Mini. You're talking about a... Are you talking about a cinema camera? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Don't soft-mount the motors, though. No, no, no. Soft-mounted motors is a thing that FPV pilots have played with on and off for years. It's a bad idea. It, it's not that it can't be done. It's that it requires a level of engineering that we're not prepared for. So, like, if we look at the... Um, uh, let's see if I can find an example of this. The Freefly Alta X has vibration-damped propellers. That's the payload vibration damper. That's not right. Vibration isolator, refresh kit. No. Advanced. There we go. Free fly advanced vibration isolation. So this is, uh, they have, a, a, I don't know if this is patented. No, again, that's not what I'm talking about. You're talking about vibration isolating the camera. Well, no, hmm. It's mistyped. <sighs> Let's see if I can just find... No, that's the propeller. Uh, active blade. That's what I'm looking... There we go. We found it. So the Freefly Alta X has a bearing in the propeller. And the propeller mount is isolated from the shaft so that the propeller can rock and not transmit vibration to the motor as it spins. Very cool. Very expensive, very complicated, and doesn't work on smaller motors. Uh, the right solution for almost all situations is to vibration isolate the camera. Right? That's what you need to do. Okay. Um, let's see. Willem de Klerk asks, uh, can an AP Perif drone cam digital power monitor be used on beta flight? Thank you for five uh, New Zealand uh, dollars. Can an app Perif, the, the, the character limit of your, should have left $10. You could have typed your whole question. I don't, I don't follow. Can an Arju pilot drone can, so can bus digital power monitor be used on beta flight? No. Beta flight does not support can bus peripherals at all. And I wouldn't assume that beta flight can support Arju pilot peripherals. I, I would assume that it cannot. Just for reference, I put it in the Discord. Thank you, Blunty. You're the man. So that Maytech flight controller might be able to run Arju Pilot, but if it's running Beta Flight, Beta Flight can't can't use this. No, cannot. Yeah. I feel pretty confident the answer to that is no. Puppet Axis, thank you for a $5 super chat. I have a jumper T20 and learning FPV in the sim. Is it a bad idea to put springs on my throttle to help learn? Yes, it's a bad idea. Um, FPV, so if you're flying an autonomous drone that has a uh, altitude hold, then a spring-loaded throttle might make sense. 
Otherwise, you the, the, the spring will cause the throttle to center. That has no meaning because you need to be looking at whether the drone is climbing or descending, and you need to be modulating the throttle based on what the drone is doing. The center, there is no reason to prefer pulling your throttle to center when you're flying in acro mode or flying a basically an FPV drone. The center doesn't mean anything. You just need to fly the damn drone. It's not going to help. Now, I have flown FPV drones with spring-loaded throttle, and you just have to ignore the spring and override it with your muscles, which isn't that hard. But it's not helping. It's just getting in the way. Opinion on the Ice Flight Blitz AT-435. Thank you for two Canadian dollars. Um, that's a new ESC. It's a new, so that's with the AT chip. It's with a new AT chip, mini AT. And the advantage of the AT chip is that it's cheaper than the STM chips that most flight controllers use. This Blitz flight controller is $30 and it's in stock. Holy crap on money. $30 and in stock. Jiminy Christmas. Um... And there's also a 30 millimeter one. I guess there is. Shut up. AT435. Here's a 30 millimeter one. 40 bucks. Pretty impressive. Um, opinion. Uh, so I have no opinion on the ESC. I think in general, iFlight makes okay ESCs. Other people think they make terrible ESCs. That just depends on your personal experience. Um... I have no reason to believe that this AT ESC is going to be any better or worse than any other iFlight ESC. It just has AT processors instead of uh, STM processors. So fine. Um, I will say, no, I won't say that. I take that back. I, I was about to say something that might bias, that might, I was about to say something about a negative experience I had on a quadcopter build that has this flight controller in it. But that build also has other things that could be causing this problem, and it wouldn't be fair for me to, like, throw shade at this flight controller, potentially, when it might be completely innocent. So I will I will not say that. So never mind. This is an unknown quantity. Let's put it that way. On one level, it's just an iFlight flight controller with a cheaper MCU, so it should be fine. Um, I will say that there are still bugs in the Betaflight 4.5 target for this flight controller. I know that for a fact because I have one and I'm testing it. Betaflight 4.5 release candidate two, bi-directional D-Shot does not work unless you manually enable D-Shot bitbang. I am told by iFlight that this will be fixed in the final 4.5 release, but at least as of today, if you buy this, you can only run Betaflight 4.5 on it. And there are some bugs in the release of Betaflight 4.5 for it. So that's worth knowing. Is the Radiomaster TX-16S Mark II analog or digital? Thank you for $2. Jake Thomas, your question doesn't make any sense. And I don't mean this in a way to make you feel dumb or to feel insulted, I, I please don't don't take it that way. But like you have a fundamental misunderstanding, and the most compassionate thing I can do for you right now is try to clear up that misunderstanding by telling you that your question doesn't make sense. It'd be like asking, uh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. What, I don't have a good analogy. I'm blanking. Um, the Radio Master TX16S Mark II, do, analog versus digital, relates to video systems typically. But the Radio Master TX16S Mark II is a controller. It has no interaction basically at all with your video system. It is what it is. It's Express LRS maybe, or 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 a four-in-one module. But it's not analog or digital because that 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 analog or digital relates to video. Okay. It is, no, it is none of the above. I mean, technically, I guess it's using digital protocol, not like an older AM or FM protocol, but there, there's no controllers made today that aren't digital. So, Could it be asking about the gimbals? 
Gimbals can he be analog in, or digital. He said in chat he's doing. He has no idea what he's asking. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, th that's that's the answer to your question. Um, Patrick Prochaska says hi from Austria. Any recommendations on an O3 4S Cinewhoop? And is the Foxier Mega 35 a good three and a half inch quad? Will there be an O4 air unit? Boy, you're stacking up those questions, Patrick. Let me do my best to answer them, and thank you for a five euro super chat. Will there be a DJI O4 unit? Yeah, someday, probably. When? Don't know. No one knows. We have pretty solid rumors right now that a new DJI FPV drone is coming and that a new DJI goggle is coming. In the past, what we've seen is like the... Avada came out with the O3 in it, and then the O3 was available separately. So maybe that will happen, but we don't know a timeline. And there's no actual confirmed rumors of a new O4 air unit. Just the assumption that the new FPV drone will course will come with a new O4 air unit. Um, any recommendations on an O3 4S Cinewhoop? Uh, my favorite Biden and Fly Cinewhoop is the GEPRC Cinelog 3.0. Uh, or or Cinebot 3.5, also pretty good. Um, is the Foxier Mega 35 good? Let's look at it. Um, I see what we got here. So we got a little three and a half inch freestyle drone with an O3 in it. Is it any good? Foxier makes good ESCs and flight controllers. Uh, the Foxier Reaper is one of the most reliable ESCs used by racers. Um, so the flight controller is probably as good as an AIO ever is, which is not great, but it's probably at least average. 2105.5 motor, pretty solid for a three and a half inch prop. Can have plenty of responsiveness and power. And the frame design looks looks okay. Like I'm not diving in deep. If you, how's the price? 320 bucks. Express LRS 2.4 gig and 03. Which motors? Oh, oh, for freestyle, I'm definitely getting 3650 KVN 4S. Yeah, for freestyle, I think the 2650 is more. It's not for 6S, is it? Nobody's going to run 6S on this. Are they? Nah, surely not. No, so, well. What battery do you, what battery should I use? Not gonna tell me? Just gonna let me guess? It's I, I know what battery you should use, but why did, why is that not on the product page, Fox here? Come on. Come on, Fox here. Help a help a brother out. Um I don't see any like deal breakers. Seems fine. Brandon Acree, thank you for a $5 super chat. Any tips on how to find an analog VTX to buy? Everything over 800 milliwatts seems to be out of stock. Uh, I suggest using searchfpv.com. Thank you for the opportunity to plug my website, but it is actually my answer. Let's do in stock only. And I'm going to do USA because that's where I'm located. But actually, if I'm really concerned about stock, maybe I should just search everywhere. In stock only. Why is... Okay. In stock only. And uh, Foxier Reaper. Oh, I guess I want the VTX, not the ESC. Technically, I should. Um, hey, Fly High FPV, do you have a high power VTX in stock? Fly High FPV points out that he has the TBS Unified Pro 32. Yeah, but is that high power? Or is that like one watt? It's like a 1.6 watt. That's That's pretty good. Most of these guys don't actually make 2.5 watts or whatever. They make about one point. Yeah, so that's a choice. Fly High FPV. He's got the Pro 32 HV. Pretty solid. Hey, Fly High FPV. How come you're not on searchfpv.com? Get it done. Anyway, I mean, do whatever you want. Sorry, I'm not trying to like, tell you what to do. I need to search for the VTX. Can I search for just VTX? Searching. Searching. Reaper Nano. That's not what I want. Reaper Mini. Those are still ESCs. Hello. 
Hello, has anyone got the VTX? No, apparently not. Apparently, we are just shit out of luck. Nope. Okay. Uh, Rush Tank Solo. Tank Solo. Here's a Rush Tank Solo. I said in stock only, you SOB. Oh, it didn't preserve my choices. Irik! Why didn't it preserve my choices? I found another bug! Wow, no, they're all out of stock, dude. Your SOL, everything is out of stock. Uh, ooh, ooh, I got it. I know the one you didn't think of. GEPRC. GEPRC, GEPRC. Here's a 2.5 watt VTX with a fan on it. What? In stock, boom! Here's a one watt VTX. In stock. Here's a 1.6 watt VTX. In stock. Boom, baby. That's what you need. Gep RC. Nobody thinks of them. There we go. All right. Good. Uh, Cinelog20, thank you Mike Shannon for a $10 super chat. After the last crash when I give it full throttle, it hovers and lists to the side, but never gets off the ground. ESC or FC probably damaged. Hard to say if that's an ESC, FC, or motor. The first thing I would do is I would use the motor test function in Betaflight to spin the motors, and I would look at if any motor has a significantly different RPM than the others. Take the props off. Since you're probably using bi-directional D-Shot, you can see the motor RPM in the motors tab. Spin the motors using the master slider. So all the motors should be at about the same RPM. And if one motor has significantly lower RPM, that motor or ESC is damaged. And that's the direction I would start. Crosser Tip says, I want to fly digital 1S Tiny Whoops, but I have DJI goggles. Do I have to change the system? Or is there a chance for a 1S DJI air unit in the future? Thank you for five euros. Uh, I, I mean, like, who can predict the future? But I wouldn't bet on that. I wouldn't bet on that. Um, if you wanted to fly a DJI air unit on 1S, you would need a step-up voltage regulator. But, like, that's, uh, like, it's, it's the weight of the DJI air unit means it's not going to be spectacular on 1S anyway. So I, I wouldn't go that direction. If you want to fly 1S, I don't think DJI is the right choice. Just period. FPV Trucker. Oh my God, we only have two more Super Chats. We had so many Super Chats. How is the... How is the uh, analytics? No. Viewer activity? Where can I see the, the, the number, the amount of Super Chats in dollars? Oh, I can't see that while I'm streaming. Really? That's weird. Oh, okay. No, I can't. Well, it's just a guess. Thank you guys for your generosity. It's Betaflight 443, the version with the bad motor tab. 442 and 443 have the bug. Uh, FPV Trucker, Flash 445, or sorry, Flash 45, release candidate 2. It's probably the right way to go if you're concerned about that feature. Just to be, just so people yeah. know, 45 RC2 uh, does not work with BL Holly 32 pass through. That's a bug. Um, oh, that's a big deal. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, um, but I would also just how tell often, people... How like, often do you need BLLA pass-through, though? If the motor tab three is people working. yesterday that had the problem, so in one day. So some people are using it, right? Freaking nerds. And if you're telling them to go... Anyway, all that I'll say is, like, I I understand where you're coming from, but I would not recommend to flash the release candidate yet. Oh, well, I am. But yeah. I, I don't need to flash BLLA very often. I just use the Betaflight motor tab, and I'm good to go. 
yeah i'm just saying that's an example of a bug that we know is there but obviously there are more okay. bugs because it's not released yet so well i do appreciate it i didn't know about that bug and that's kind of yeah. a big deal for you know nerds who want to flash their escs um jake thomas i am very ignorant I just started researching the hobby last night. Really appreciate you being nice about it. Have a great day. No problem, Jake. I'm glad you. I'm glad that we had a positive interaction, and I could help you out. Uh, thank you for a five dollar donation. And that is it. We are caught up on the super chats. Holy crap, you guys! Thank you for all the super chats. We Blenty has just posted that we have over fifty queued questions for the first time ever. I am going to try to. I may go a little bit long today, Siati. I apologize. Siati streams at three o'clock and I, I always hate to stream over him. I like to, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm stepping on his uh, time slot, but we have so many questions queued up. We may go a little bit long today and try and get a few more questions answered um, because the super chats went much longer than they usually do. And I definitely want to make sure people get their time. So uh, let's see here. Any ideas how to reduce prop wash when flying through doorways or close to things? Thank you, Fly, uh, Fly James, for the question. Um, generally, the answer to reducing prop wash is degain, is less filtering and more degain. Now, the problem is that prop wash when flying cl close to doorways and stuff, that's going to be very hard for the PID loop to deal with. Like prop wash when you're descending is somewhat sort of rhythmic right and and, and semi predictable and the pid loop if it, it has low enough latency and and the right pid tune can mostly deal with it but when when you're next to a doorway or a wall it's so chaotic i don't i wouldn't count on the pid loop to be able to handle it so two things i would do um sure pid tune pid tune to your heart's content that's probably not going to fix it number 1 that's why everybody who flies Cinewhoops uses stabilization. So use a camera setup that you can have good stabilization on. And number two, use a smaller drone. When I did my real estate fly through video, I used, I think it was a 3.0, maybe it was a three and a half inch drone. And people said, that's too big. For indoor, and I was like, what do you mean? The three and a half inch, it was easy to fly. They're like, yeah, but the props make too much turbulence, too much prop wash. And it, it, it shakes your drone around. Some people who fly indoor, like real estate fly throughs, prefer a two or a two and a half inch drone because the smaller props make less prop wash and less turbulence as you're flying through tight areas. So those are two pieces of advice. Aeroscare on the Discord asks, are you more excited for the future of FPV now or was the future more exciting when you started your journey? Um, Aeroscare, there's no way to reproduce the the thrill and excitement of getting into a new hobby there's no substitute for that because you are just this open book this blank slate that's the right term you are this blank slate and you're just sucking in all this information and every piece of it is new and exciting Everything you do is new. It's the first time you've done it. It's amazing. And then you get to a point where you've been in FPV for eight years and you're the FPV know-it-all. And there's still a lot to learn. There's still a lot to learn, obviously. And it's still exciting and interesting. But there's no... That's different than everything being new and exciting and interesting. Right? Right? So I would say that the it was more exciting when I first got started. And and the future of FPV when I first got started, so what about like the future? It was it was wide open and it was only up only going to get better and bigger better things from from here on. Right? Uh and now that's tempered some. Like in some ways FPV has gone and will continue to go to new exciting heights. We've seen FPV shots. We saw Alex Vanover fly a cinema drone for Michael Bay in a major Hollywood movie. If I had said that sentence in 2016, I would have been like, shut up. 
Shut up. You're that's be it. That that whoa, that would be a dream come true in 2016. That would be FPV has made it. We've seen FPV drones become a a standard tool in the in the toolkit of cinematic commercials, music videos, live concerts. FPV is just it's there. And and it's it's still it'll be more there in the future. It's not as there as some tools like a steady cam or like a, a, a jib crane, right? It, but it's there. It's there. And it will only get more there. Um, on the flip side, though, we've got things like remote ID. We've got things like regulation. We've got things like the military use of drones that we see this footage coming out of Ukraine. And, we, and, and that sort of puts a damper on all that. Where like just the pure unbridled joy of flying, we still go out and we still have the the joy of flying, but on some level in the back of many people's minds is like, oh, what's the future hold? And we've got since 2020, you know, chip shortages, prices have doubled or tripled, right? So like there's these other things that put a damper on it. And those things weren't there in 2016. In 2016, the things that put a damper on it were our flight controllers fly like crap, <laughs> you know, but it was like there was this feeling that we were going to make it better. Like we had clean flight and then beta flight came out and Boris B started doing all these things. Boris B introduced a low pass filter on the D term, which clean flight didn't have. What does that mean? Well, some of you know and some of you don't, but it was so exciting because our quads flew so much better. Oh my God. And I remember. We had three different PID controllers you could choose from. Three different PID controllers. And there were all these arguments about which PID controller flies better. And then Betaflight came along and Betaflight was like, no, we're going to have one PID controller. And everyone was like, oh, I don't know if I like this. What about the, what? But, but, you know, then it got better and it got better and it got better. So in the past, the things that put a damper on our fun were things that it felt like we could control. Like we could write better code. We could make better flight controllers. We could make better quadcopters and better motors and make quads fly better. And today the things that put a damper on our fun are things that feel, I'm speaking, I'm saying our, but I'm obviously speaking from my own perspective here. And I don't presume that I speak for everyone in the FPV community. Just gonna, just wanna put that out there because someone will be like, oh, who's he speak for us? Obviously I'm speaking for myself in the, in the second part or in the, in the plural. Uh, but the things that put a damper on our fun are things that feel like they're out of our control. Things like macroeconomics, things like chip shortages, things like regulation. So. I think that I was more excited for the future when I first started for all those reasons, but I'm still excited. I'm still having fun. That's the thing that you got to keep in mind. And I'll, I hear I, I am giving advice here and you can take it or leave it. If you start to get overwhelmed with the FUD, just put your head down and fly, go to a race, go fly with your friends. I mean, I think that's a skill that a lot of people have developed in the last five years, four years. There was so much shit going on in the world. And I'm not going to, I don't want to get into like specific shit that you want to argue about in the comments. This isn't the place for it. But let's just suffice it to say that no matter who you are, you probably look around at the world in the last five years and go, man, there's a whole lot of stuff here that bothers me that I kind of wish wasn't happening and I wish I didn't have to think about. And the good news is that, you know, it's okay to take a break from that. It's okay to go, look, I'm not going to, I'm just going to go fly my drone and let that be my escape. You can still do that. So, um, anyway, why is my air unit drawing two to 2.5 amps in low power mode? I don't know. How many amps should it draw in low power mode? Is that normal? What voltage are you feeding it? Because obviously the input, how many watts is it pulling? That's the question. I have no idea what the, like the normal, I think that the O3 maxes out at 12 watts. No, 17 watts. 
Okay, let's look it up. Can't think about amps. We have to start by thinking about watts. Oscar Leung, God bless him. Always here to answer our questions. And Mads Tech, God bless him. Always here to answer our questions. And DJI, who the hell are they? Um, 16 to 17 watts. Okay, I was about right. So let's do some math. Seventeen watts divided by two point five amps is six point eight volts. So that's about uh that's no, that's not right. So if you were feeding it seven volts, you'd get about two and a half amps to, at max power. I agree it shouldn't do that in low power mode. But I have no idea why. I mean I I I have to assume that the O3 is working as intended. And we're just misunderstanding exactly how it works. Like low power mode doesn't necessarily mean, I don't, I don't know, but like low power mode doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a, transmitting less power out the amplifier. That's the thing. Low power mode means it turns down the frame rate and the encoding to, to take some heat off the processor. It may be that the RF amplifier stays. Oh, good. Madstech is here. Aha! Thank you, Matt's Tech. That's where I was going. I was about to get there. You have confirmed it, and you know. Matt's Tech points out, and it's actually his research that I was quoting, that in low power mode, the amplifier actually stays about the same output power. But what happens is that the frame rate goes down and the bit rate goes down. And what that does is the actual primary buildup of heat in the O3 is not the RF power amplifier, but it is the, the processor that's doing the encoding of the video. And so the low power mode doesn't actually draw much less power because the amplifier is the same. It just generates less heat. So what you're seeing, I guess, is normal drawn about 17 watts. Um, if you want to reduce that, give it a higher voltage and the amps will go down. But who really cares? If you do care, give it a higher voltage. I bought a Titan XL5 frame and a Foxier Predator V5 mini camera, but it doesn't fit. Oh, you're screwed, dude. I'm sorry, Docus, you are screwed. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it. Foxy or Predator? Let's just confirm that I'm right. Predator Mini. So a mini cam is like uh, 22 millimeters across, I think. It's like uh, the typical cams used on modern frames are micro cams, which are 19 millimeters. Or nano cams which are 14 millimeters and then way back when we had the full size cams which are 26 millimeters I think if my memory is right and I don't think there's really any way it's, I'm being told it's 21 millimeters I was close uh, I, I uh, am started being uh, I, I don't think that there's any way to fit a mini cam on a frame designed for a micro it's like like, maybe with some luck. Come on. Shut the F up. Fine. I don't want to go. Maybe there's a way with a 3D print to kind of stuff the lens in between the standoffs. But, like, it's not going to fit in between the side plates. You would need to... Like, I would just tell you to buy another camera, okay? To be honest with you. But... If you, or maybe you could decase that camera and put it in a micro sized case because the lens is the same. So, like, if I was trying to do this, I would do a 3D printed bracket. The lens is the same size, just the case won't fit between the side plates. I would remove the side plates and. I would use the 3D printed bracket to hold the case and, and the case would have to just fit behind the standoffs. You could probably get that working. Okay, that's what I would do. 
because the lens is the same size, so the lens will fit. It's just the side plates that are your problem. So just ditch the side plates and 3D print a mount. And like when I say, oh, just 3D print a mount, watch how easy it is. Okay, ready? <clears throat> Boom. I would start here. So that's just going to go over the standoff. Now that may not be quite right. I don't know. Is it going to work? Maybe I need to push it back more. Okay. How about this one? Okay. Thingiverse would be my second choice. Sometimes Thingiverse has things that printables don't. Here's the same source two that I already have. Ah, universal FPV camera mount. Now we're getting somewhere. Oh, I like this. This is looking good. Files. Boom. Yeah, so I, I would just do something like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, what's your favorite drink? Hmm. An alcoholic drink? Either a gin and tonic or an old fashioned. What do you think? Should I use a 72 megahertz radio in 2024? No. 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 There is no reason to do that unless you just like doing it for historical sake. There is no reason. Express LRS, Crossfire, you name it, they all offer way better performance than 72 megahertz. But I can go a million miles on 72 megahertz. Yeah, well, you know, good for you. I can ride a million miles on a on a on a on a one of them big bicycles with a giant front wheel. Doesn't mean I should I could ride a million miles I could walk a million miles through the desert with nothing but my bare feet touching the hot sand. We have evolved past that. We we have airplanes, we have cars, we have Crossfire, we have Express LRS. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> no Nickname No Name asks, why Betaflight doesn't detect loose props? I burned a motor, but I had no chance to spot it in mid-flight. If you couldn't tell from the vibration and the terrible blah, 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 blah sound that the motor was making, if you couldn't tell that the prop was loose, how would Betaflight know that the prop is loose? Uh, Ghostface50 wants to know, thoughts on fixing motor interference when running surface FPV? Uh, Ghostface, uh, I don't know if you mean vibrations, in which case you would want to soft mount the camera or have a have a uh, gimbal that can sort of counteract the movements. Uh, if you mean electrical interference, I guess capacitors are the answer. They used to make capacitors you could plug into your receiver, and it would it would add capacitance to the five volt rail. That's probably still a thing. Um, Biochi asks: Is the Walksnail Avatar Pro camera compatible with the Nano Three VTX? Yes. Uh, all Walksnail Avatar cameras are compatible with all Walksnail VTXs, as far as I know. Anybody know different? Uh, Blunty? No, I was, I was just going to say, once you're past this, I know where we were going to go long, but we should probably mop up Super Chats before the end of the hour. Oh, good idea. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit long, just because we got so many questions and so many Super Chats, but that's a good point. We've gotten a couple more Super Chats. We'll clean them up before the end of the hour. Lloyd, thank you for a $10 super chat. I'm looking to build a large lifter on the cheap with sunny sky motors and 15 inch props. You think I could buy with a 450 amp ESC? We go with individual 40 amp ESCs, probably 4S. Um, 
I'm confused, Lloyd. If you're buying a a four in one fifty amp, ah, got it. Um, uh, so a, a four in one fifty amp ESC. If you believe that fifty amps, like I don't know how many amps those motors are going to pull, and I'm I, I'm not familiar enough with fifteen inch builds or twelve inch builds to guess whether fifty amps is enough. So the first question is, how many amps do you need to support those motors? If we assume that fifty amps is enough, which I'm not st- I'm not stipulating, I'm not endorsing that claim. You have to figure that out. But if we assume that fifty amps is enough. The only downside with a 50 amp ESC is that if you burn one, then you got to, well, you don't have to, but you're going to probably end up replacing all of them. And that can be expensive. Frankly, I'm surprised to see a 50 amp ESC on a heavy lift. Like if I think about the Cine lifters and other heavy lift birds that I've seen people build, they're all using like 80 to 120 amp ESCs. So my gut feeling is that that 50 amp ESC is is under spec, but I don't know because only see the problem is you say heavy lift a large lifter. It, can you build a 12 inch or a 15 inch quadcopter that can fly on 50 amps of motor? Huh? Absolutely, absolutely. It's going to be fairly light and it's going to do a lot of cruising and not a lot of high power high throttle maneuvers. But yeah, 100. percent It's going to depend a lot on the KV of the motors. But if you're building a heavy lifter, now you know you're going to be pushing the motors, right? And you're going to be lifting some number of kilograms of cargo. At which point, I think that probably my, my gut feeling is that the 50 amp ESCs are under spec. Um, the main reason people go with individual ESCs is that, especially as you're building larger quadcopters, each individual ESC is expensive. And if you fry one, you want to be able to replace just that one and not have to replace the whole thing. But I think you should very carefully evaluate whether 40 or 50 amps is enough for the actual flight conditions you're going to be under. I'm not sure that's the case. Um, Lance Flagg, nice uh, nice call out to Stephen King's The Stand. Uh, although if that's the character you're choosing to name yourself after, I'm not sure I want to hang out with you. <laughs> Ba- uh, Mamba Basic F722 Mini Mark III. Is this the correct wiring diagram for the O3 Air Unit? Sent you an email with a link. All right. Here we go. Is this the correct wiring diagram for the DJI O3? Uh, page not found. Oh, I see what happened. Hold on. Mamba Universal Wiring Guide. I mean, is this the correct wiring diagram? Oh, so what you're saying is they don't have an O3. Uh, yeah, but... Do they have a Vista? What do they got? I mean... No. So, uh, yeah, you can, you can use this wiring diagram with the O3. Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, and the same advice applies. You will not use the brown and the yellow wires if you're not using the DJI FPV controller. So you, most people will not be using the DJI FPV controller and most people will only be doing the gr- red, the black, the gray, and the white wire. But yeah, that wiring diagram is correct. Just make sure you're giving it between 7 and 26 volts, which it sounds like is the case. I believe that's correct. Uh, Jay Konas. Thank you for a 10 Swiss francs. FPV with open IPC looks very promising. Could companies make the hardware based on open source design? Yes, they could. Could it compete with DJI? No. No. Absolutely not. Ooh, that's bold. Every time you make a bold statement like that, you're setting yourself up for people to throw it in your face later. So I should qualify that by saying there's no way DJI is so competitive competitive in terms of their performance. Nobody has matched them in terms of range, penetration, and image quality. I'll just I'll stand by that statement. No matter how good you think like Walksnail is, or, or 
nobody argues nobody argues that HD0 has the same range of penetration and image quality as O3, right? No, but not even the biggest HD0 fanboy. I mean, it has its strong points. I'm not trying to put it down, but it's Waxnail. There are a few people out there who will go, no, Waxnail's just as good as O3. I disagree. Respectfully, I disagree. I think you're wrong, but we can disagree. But like nobody, and Waxnail's come as close as anybody has, and they've made a damn good product. And it has a lot of things that would make you choose Waxnail over O3, but they are not pure, well, range. Ah, range! Waxnail doesn't have the hard range limit that O3 does. Okay, okay. If you're flying out past like 23 kilometers, Waxdale wins for range. But if you're flying anywhere where you're, you know, where penetration is the issue, maybe. Anyway, uh, so a, an open source project like I open IPC, I, there's no way they'll catch up with DJI. DJI is way too far ahead for almost anybody to catch up. Um, but theoretically, people could make hardware designs based on it. But it's not mature enough to do that yet. And I will I will leave it at that because we actually talked about Open IPC for like 15 minutes back at the very beginning of the stream. It'll be around the 15 minute mark we started, maybe the the 10 minute mark. And if you want to, you can rewind the stream and go watch that. We talked in, about it in quite a lot of quite a lot of detail. Um, okay, now we will enter the bonus section of the stream. Obviously, if you want to leave Super Chats, we will read those Super Chats before the end. But I said I would go a little long because we have a lot of questions queued up. I do want to acknowledge we are not going to get to all of the questions that are queued up. Anybody, anybody is welcome to email me, jb at joshuabardwell.com. I answer my, uh, clear my inbox once a day. Uh, occasionally, I'll, a message will be like, I'll require a little research or something and I won't get back on that very day, but um, anyone's welcome to email me and I'll do my best to answer. So if I don't get to your question on the live stream, please feel free to take advantage of that. I uh, would not like your question to be unanswered, just can't answer all of them uh, on stream. Um, uh, Martin FPV wants to know which capacitor should I use? A 6S, I've got a 6S quadcopter, 35 volt 1000 or 50 volt 470. Um, Martin, uh, the engineering recommendation for capacitors is to derate them by half. So for a 25 volt system, you'd use a 50 volt capacitor. By that logic, the 50 volt 470 would be the one to choose. But the engineering design assumes you're building an appliance that's going to last 10, 15 years, something, right? Uh, and we're not. So 35 volts is the standard capacitance to use on a 6S quad. And I would take the additional capacitance over the additional voltage rating un unless and until somebody showed me results that that is the wrong choice to make. Like I don't, I haven't seen anybody testing with actual capacitors under controlled laboratory conditions to determine whether the voltage rating versus the capacitance rating makes the most effect on like clean motor traces and clean gyro data. But the standard that everyone who builds quads is, does is to use 35 volts capacitors on 6S builds, and it seems to work. And so that's probably what I would stick with. Okay. Um, uh, Jekyll, Jekyll, Jekyll. Welcome back. Haven't seen you in a while. I haven't tried to pronounce your name in a while. Jekyll, like heckle. Uh, haven't heard your opinion about 3D printers in a while. Do you consider that a separate thing to FPV or only utilitarian to FPV? I mean, uh, it is certainly at least utilitarian. Um, if you're wondering, like I made, I reviewed the Bamboo X1C. I just did a video about using Orca Slicer to slice content. Usually when someone says, hey, I haven't heard you talk about X in a while, it means that they haven't actually gone to my channel and looked at the videos I've made. Because usually I made a video about that thing, you just didn't see it because the algorithm didn't show it to you. So like, if, uh, if we go to my channel, and I know that we all just start up YouTube and start scrolling, right? But if you are actually wondering about content that I have made, you can go to my channel and click on the videos page and you will see, for example, 
for example, how far ago, how long ago was, here we go. Here is a 3D printing content uh, one month ago. So I'm still making 3D printing content. Uh, you just may not be seeing it because you're relying on the algorithm. That's what I would say. Darwin FPV has just released a new quad, the Fold Ape 4, a lightweight, long-range, budget, foldable quad. Could you check it out? Okay, I will check it out. But I've got to say, my first impulse is to think that folding quads are a dumb novelty that, that makes the quadcopter worse. And is like, I, so I'm inclined, I'm predisposed not to like it. Especially because you're telling me it's a four inch. Four inches aren't that big anyway. Like you give me a foldable eight inch. I'm like, okay, I see the point. It's pretty freaking huge. You give me a foldable, like a big foldable cinema drone. Yeah, it's got to pack down and go inside a, a Pelican case or whatever. You give me a foldable four inch. I'm like, nah, why? What am I going to put it in my pocket? I don't know. Just a hater. Uh, cute. It folds down really small. Okay. So how does it fold? What's the folding mechanism? That's the problem with all of these foldable drones. I mean, cool. It folds down really small. Does it foldable props? So I can't decide if that's a plus or a minus. On the one hand, a foldable drone without foldable props is stupid because you got to take the props off to fold it. On the other hand, foldable props have all these, have certain problems all their own. But okay, I, I, I'm down for that choice. How does it fold? Show me the folding mechanism. What locks the arms into place? Oh my God. That's it. I can't get a close-up of the folding mechanism. Oh, boy. It goes in my pocket. No one's going to do that. Uh -huh. Ah, they saw me coming. <laughs> Arms are fixed with two screws after being unfolded. After the screws are locked, it will be no difference. Okay, we got two screws we take out to fold it. I mean... I guess. I mean, at least it's not just pure friction. Right, Scott Arrow? If it was pure friction, it would be a lo losing thing. On the other hand, I mean, like, I can, I can fold a lot of drones if I take out the arm screws. So I got to take out two screws, and I fold the arms and put it away. I'm never going to do this. I'm just going to throw this thing on my backpack or throw it in my case. I'm never going to do this. When am I ever going to do this? When am I ever going to care enough about folding this thing up to take out two screws, which I will subsequently lose? Like you could argue about durability and you could argue that a four inch cruiser like this is not built to crash primarily. So even if there is a decrease in durability, okay, it's not like designed to crash first and foremost. Fair. But um, I'm never going to do this. I'm just going to leave it how it is. Oh, but if you fold it, you can put it in your pocket. Okay. One guy's going to do that ever, and it's going to be this guy. It's going to be the guy doing the marketing. Here he is. The only time in history that anyone folded this drone up and put it in their pocket. This model. <laughs> I'm such a, I'm such a hater. I'm such a, I'm a, ter I'm terrible. Uh, <laughs> Look, we did something new and interesting and innovative. F you. F you. How dare you even try. I'm such a hater. <laughs> Okay, we made a four-inch drone and it doesn't fold. Why didn't you do anything new and interesting and innovative? You just copied everything that came before. I don't like anything. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> do you do you do you look at four-inch drones and go, ah, it's too big. I wish it were smaller. Well, here you go. The Darwin FPV Fold Ape 4. 
It's like a four-inch drone, but you can fold it down. You got to take out some screws to do it. So, you know, basically it's a four-inch drone that you can disassemble. All right. Darwin FPV, don't take me too seriously. I'm a total hater. And I think this is cool that you did this. I just hate everything. And um, that's why I'm a good product reviewer. You know, you know, I'm not going to name names. I don't want you guys to name names in the chat because let's not be mean and point fingers. But you know there's some reviewers out there who people accuse them of just being overly positive. They just love everything. I'm the opposite of that. I hate everything. I don't know. Take your pick. <laughs> oh, speaking of things I hate. Can you please look at the Speedy B Mario 5? It looks interesting and innovative. I don't know. Let's look at it. I'll probably hate it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is why I stop after two hours. Because I just get loopy. And silly. There was no alcohol in my drink. I'm just like this. <laughs> the Speedy B Mario 5 frame. Well, I freaking love the price. I, I love the price. $33. Okay. Speedy B, by pricing this frame at $33, $34, you have immediately forgiven a multitude of sins. Okay? Like, if you were selling this frame, I haven't looked at the frame yet, but if you were selling this frame for $60 or $80, I would nitpick the shit out of it. I'm probably still going to nitpick the shit out of it. But at the end of the day, it's $35, $34. So, eh, fine. What, is, what does Speedy B think I need to know about the Mario 5? Why the Mario? Is it named after somebody? Or is it like... Mario 5 Dead Cat and X version? Good. Interchangeable parts, good. Uh, two and a half mil bottom plate, that's fine. Six mil arms, good. I would love a grippy battery pad, not a silicone battery pad, but that's okay. Everybody does that. Even my frame has a silicone battery pad. What the hell does my... Anyway, it's a topic for another day. I need to go whine and get FPV some more. High strength alloy. So metal front end, good for durability. What the hell is this? That's kind of cool. I mean, some kind of a metal brace? It looks cool as shit. Not that that matters. I like the versatile camera mounting. It's going to work with the O3, but it's also going to work with other cameras. You got your, that's really good. Recessed GoPro mount. That's cute, but the problem is that the lower you make the GoPro, the more it interferes with the battery when you tilt it back. So, like, unless this is an exceptionally long top plate, and it and it isn't, you're potentially going to... Well, it, it might be long enough. I don't know. You're potentially going to have issues with pushing the battery back too far when the GoPro leans back. I'm not sure that lowering the GoPro is actually the, the best decision. It's got a soft mount for the GoPro. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Unique carbon plate arm support structure. Oh, interesting. So they've half milled the arms. So the arms overlap and have a single screw holding them together. That's interesting. Does it brace then? Oh, what the F? No, we also have these braces here to keep the arms from moving. Ah, that's clever. Oh, and we stick the capacitor down in between the arms. That's clever. That's clever. Uh, I would prefer... So I can't help but notice that we, I wonder whether that's going to be a weak spot here, whether we're going to see. So as I look at this arm and I think, where is this arm going to break? 
it feels like a frontal impact, okay, is going to drive the force back this direction, placing stress on this thin part of the arm. And I, but then I see it's going to be braced here, isn't it? And likewise, that might be more clever than it's, that's interesting. So it's going to be braced here and then push here. And that's actually, that's actually pretty slick. That's pretty slick. Ah, see, I see, see that this is the thing. I'm not just a hater, am I? I'm not just shitting on everything because I'm cynical, bitter person. Like I've actually taken the time to look at this and think about it. And I started trying to find the weaknesses and I found what I thought was a weakness. And then I realized, no, they've covered that. And I gave credit where credit's due. I still am not entirely convinced, but they, they've really thought this through, and that's kind of cool. I like that they've thought about where to stick the capacitor. Very clever. Okay. They've thought about where to put the receiver. I, I actually... Have they published the STLs? Oh, okay, Speedy B. Okay, Speedy B. You, you got me. I'm impressed with this frame. You got me. Did they? I think they asked me to review this. Hang on. Did they? Let me not just put all my email up on, up on the stream for everyone to see. Hold on. Let me look. Yes. Okay. Okay, here we are. Speedy B customer service, blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay. Okay, done. Thank you for the uh, chat. Uh, thank you for the chat. Who left that chat? Uh, CZ Lemon. We should Very probably cool. hit the couple super chats we have. Yeah, thank you, Bloody. Absolutely. Um, Avai Pratap Singh Kuntal. Kuntal. I did my best. Thank you for 40 rupees. Suggest to me the best VTX and goggles for racing. HD0. The HD0 race VTX and the HD0 goggles. Right? That's the answer, right? Obviously, guys, right? Does anyone disagree with that? I just got new headphones because my other headphones, well, I thought they broke. It turned out the cable was broken, but I replaced. Anyway, that's not important. I'm not sure how I feel about these silver things. I've just noticed them. Is that like like shining? And the? I look like I've got some freaking halo on my head. I may, I may black those out. Uh, Jay to the flip. Thank you for 5.99 euros. I don't know why I said your name like that. Just with a name like that, it felt like it should be said like that. Jay to the flip. Uh, let's see if Jay has a question. HT0 is best. He agrees. Uh, thank you for 60. I don't see a question from you, Jay. So thank you for the donation. And Farmer Trucker FPV. Thank you for 13.99 Canadian dollars. A Canadian. Hey, buddy. You got a question about FPV? Got to give me some of them uh, Canadian dollars, yeah? How do I get better at not... How do I get better at not frying my electronics? I've killed one flight controller by my fault and two randomly. One after a crash, one after sitting for the winter. That's my best Canadian accent. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I mean, you killed a flight controller in a crash. Like, when you crash, things break. I don't know... Like, it's hard to say, like, whether that was your fault or just bad luck. Um, one after sitting for the winter. Like, how... I, I, I don't know if I can answer this question, Farmer Trucker. Like, it was sitting for the winter and you just plugged it in and it smoked? Like, I don't... I can't... That can't be your fault. You just got unlucky. 
if you killed one like when you were soldering like there's like don't don't get solder spatter all over it or don't you know I, without knowing more details on exactly how it died it's hard to know but like killing flight killing electronics is just part of this hobby when someone says they've had the same quadcopter for three years and they have i'm like you you don't get out much do you <laughs> you just fly uh on a nice warm summer day over a grassy field at an altitude of one meter and a speed of three miles an hour and there's nothing wrong with that but like you just if you fly you're gonna kill things that's all i can say um, without knowing more details about exactly how you fried it, I can't say. Um, we should we should wrap up. Jay to the flip has this question that uh, from the super chat he didn't put in. Okay. Do you want to finish that one? Sure. Yeah. Flip. Jay to the flip says thanks for the shootout. You're a great guy. What's your suggested for a seven inch prop on a TBS Source One seven inch with naked GoPro? I think most of the bind and flies I use are using the HQ seven point five inch props. And they seem to do okay. Um, I know that... Uh, did Chris Rosser review? Did Chris Rosser review? I think he did. Uh, so then the other thing I would do is I would refer you to Chris Rosser's 7-inch prop review. Um, because I do know there are some 7-inch props out there that people go, oh, no, don't use those. They're terrible. And 7 inches is the size where balance starts to become an issue. So you definitely want to get a good one. All of the bind and flies that I have flown, I haven't ever, I haven't built a seven inch in a long time, if ever. So that's why I reference bind and flies. They all have the HQ 7.5 inch prop. And so that would be the one I would point you toward. But check out Chris Rosser's seven inch prop testing. Chris Rosser, here it is. And uh, definitely take a look at his results. The only thing is like, I got to say, did he actually like test their balance? Or did he just do the standard thrust tests and so forth? In which case, I think he missed a beat. Where are the... Chris! How dare you not have chapter markers? Chris, why would you do this to me? 2022, uh, that's probably why, but yeah. I were in chapter markers in 2022. That's no excuse. Chapter markers have been a thing for a long time. I'm not letting him off that easy, Blunty. I'm sorry. Did he measure? Did he measure vibration? Is my question. If he didn't, then he missed max thrust. Fine. Chris gets a lot of things right, but he sometimes gets a little too into the lab. And oh, yay! Not this time. Well done, Chris. Well done. If Chris, if there was any criticism to make of Chris's work, it would be that sometimes he is so heads down in the lab that he misses a characteristic that people care about in the real world. And and uh, and that doesn't mean his results are wrong. It just means they may be incomplete or lead to different conclusions than people in the real world. But he didn't, not in this time, he got the vibration right, which is the best, best vibration. HQ 7 by 3.5 by 3. Uh, yeah. HQ 7 by 4 by 3. Seven by four point. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this is sorted, right? Yeah, it's sorted. Oh my God. The 7.5 inch is terrible. Holy crap. Well, never mind. I take it back. The HQ 7.5 inch props have terrible vibration characteristics. Go figure. Oh, that's the bi blade. No, there's the tri blade. Also terrible. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I, take a look I just at this want to video. Point out one thing that will make this not quite as valid is that propellers are molded. There are almost yep. zero chance it's the same mold. Unless they're you, old propellers, right? Right, because the molds wear out. Yes. So you think there could be a new mold and they could be more more well balanced. We, yes, I just think like, yeah, if you're looking at prop batches, I, I think mold does matter. At least I've been told by people, you know, before. That okay, that well, matter, so. yeah, Something I mean, consider. like they start with a CAD file. Then a, a a CNC mill mills out the mold, right? So presumably those molds should be pretty repeatable. But then again, it doesn't take much variance to throw off the balance of a prop rotating at thousands of RPM. So I think as the molds wear out, I don't know that they wear. Oh, uniformly. I see your point. Yes. 
So whether you are at the beginning or the end of a mold's life cycle could significantly affect the balance. And, and I think at the end of one mold versus another mold, it would be different based on where, but I don't know if that's the case or not, right? I could see that. So the, 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 this is a problem that I've always had, and it really got in my head when I was doing battery testing, uh, which is that I do a battery test, and I know for a fact that like six months later, people are it's a different batch of batteries and who knows if the results have changed and i didn't know how to account for that in this case we've got this video from chris and i have every have every uh, confidence that these results are accurate but are they accurate today a year later or six months later if we were to retest these would we get the same results in terms of like the vibration if he was to buy 50 of the prop and test each of them what would this because well, there's going to be a variance there it's not going to and he, he didn't do that and he didn't do that because it would be it would require an insane amount of work and some result is better than none but like i've never had a problem with the vibration on the seven and a half inch props and yet they're at the bottom of this list so should you buy them well i don't know i will leave you guys with that that is where we're going to wrap uh, up we, we, we got, got another super chat Mike, Mike Bundy uh, says, love you guys. Great stream for 10 bucks. And then we got Thank one more like. question. What would you uh, like in a DJI Goggles 3? Rumors. I, I don't know. Well, what we know that it will have, at least the new goggle, like all the rumors, everything we've seen, says there's going to be front-facing cameras that work for pass-through. Kind of cool. Yeah. Um, other than that, I don't expect much. I expect like 04 compatibility, right? Yeah, well, I hope what the main thing I would like that I'm not sure I'm going to get is backwards compatibility with the Vista and the Runcam Link. So the Goggles 2 originally did not have that and then was added later in a firmware update. And I think that one generation of backwards compatibility is like if for DJI to give us two generations of backwards compatibility, I would be like surprised, happily surprised. But I would not be surprised to find out that the, the the third generation of goggles doesn't have backwards compatibility to the Vistas. And it would be nice if it did, because it would suggest that the lifespan of the Vista generation VTXs will be extended. So that's the main thing I think that's up in the air. We'll see. I would expect to see goggles to get future forward compatibility with the new 04 when it comes. I would definitely expect that. Um, I oh, would really? not expect the V. You, you, you don't think so? Well, that's an interesting concept then, because that means that will be the ultimate goggle, right? Because goggles two could do Vista, can do O3, do and you not think, system. It just feels like the goggles two hasn't been around long enough that they would just, and it feels like they've been a little more uh, open to that kind of thing with the FPV systems. Like, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I like, for like the, go the Goggles 2 supports the FPV drone, right? Now, that's one generation back. But the V2 goggle supports the O3, which is one generation forward. See? Yeah, no, I definitely understand where you're coming from. Absolutely. I just so I would, it's, it's interesting yeah. me to, to, to me to consider that, like, the Integra and Goggles 2 are going on fire sale right now. And yeah. that... The goggles too would actually be better because the new goggles probably won't have this support. I don't know. It's going to be weird. And then how long will that take? What the timeline is? Yeah, it'll be very interesting yeah, to see how all this shakes out. It's difficult to read the tea leaves because in some ways DJI has broken their patterns in the past in the FPV system market. Like the fact that the V2 goggle got O3 support, that is not consistent with the image that some people to, in, on some days me have of them kind of ruthlessly funneling customers forward to new products right and just basically if you bought an old product cool enjoy you're not getting the new hotness um that they kept the v2s alive instead of forcing people to buy the g2 if they want o3 compatibility that's that's huge and it's it's good it's good and and based on that kind of like the fact that Runcam still makes links and Cadex apparently still makes Vistas, makes that that's only happening because DJI deems it to be, DJI allows it and uh, supports it. Uh, so, so either the new goggles will be the line in the sand 
where now the V2, the Vista, the Runcam Link, bye-bye, you're gone forever, and the G2, and the, that's the new thing. Or maybe they'll have backwards compatibility, I think certain, and, and forwards compatibility. Yeah, so that's the, 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 the questions are, number one, will the G2 get forwards compatibility to the O4 Air unit? Number two, will the will the G3 have backwards compatibility to the Vista generation? Uh, and then uh, number, I guess you could ask if the V2 will get forwards compatibility to the to the O4, but I doubt. I think that's like there's no question that that's not going to happen. So. All right, guys, we are going to wrap up. Thank you so much for your questions. Again, if I didn't answer your question and I, I, there were like 42 questions I didn't answer, so be it. That's how live streams are. Please email your question if you want an answer or if you definitely want me to answer it on stream, you got a super chat. That's how it is. It's just how it is. Uh, but if you email your question, I will answer it in private. Uh, and thank you, Blunty, for sticking around for an extra half hour. Appreciate you, man. Uh, yeah. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody.